Another time I was having breakfast with Blanche and I asked her, tell me, is no the correct answer to this question? She said, to what question? I said, oh, the question I just asked. Is no the correct answer to that question? She said, no, of course not. I said, aha. Uh -huh. You answered no, didn't you? Yes. Did you answer correctly? Yes. Therefore, no is the correct answer to the question. Yes. When I asked her what I was, she sure said yes, not no. She thought for a second, oh, yes, of course. Yeah, I should just answer yes. But no, no, no. Yes can't be the right answer because, look, if you answer yes, you're affirming that no is the correct answer. In which case, why did you give the incorrect answer yes? She said, you're confusing me. Fortunately, she did not divorce me for this. It's pretty difficult having a, an overly rational husband, isn't it? In fact, the following story shows well the dangers of being, why a person should not be overly rational. It's a dialogue between two individuals, between a uh, husband and a wife. Wife, do you love me? Husband, well, of course, what a ridiculous question. Wife, you don't love me. Husband, now what kind of nonsense is this? Because if you really loved me, you couldn't have done what you did. Darling, I already explained to you, the reason I did what I did was uh, such and such a reason, not because I don't love you. But that such and such is only a rationalization. The real reason was so and so, and that so and so had never have occurred if you really loved me, etc., etc. Next morning at breakfast, Darling, do you love me? Husband, I'm not so sure. Wife, what? Husband, I thought I did, but the proof you gave me yesterday that I don't was not too bad. Not only is it not good to be overly rational, it's also not good to be overly pedantic, as the following poem will reveal. I forget the author, it may have been Ogden Nash, but I'm not sure. The poem goes as follows. I give you now Professor Twist, a conscientious scientist, and that is a fact he never bungles, so they sent him off to distant jungles. While camping by the riverside, one day he missed his loving bride. His wife, a guide informed him later, had been eaten by an alligator. Professor Twist could not but smile. You mean, he said, a crocodile. Let me ask you this now. Is it possible for the words yes and no to be used synonymously? I can think of an example where it can be. He's not a nice guy. Oh, yes. He's not a nice guy. Oh, no. In both cases, yes and no, we used affirmatively. You know, the mathematician Professor Ulam, uh, once told me he thought of what he called the Nixon paradox. The first day that Nixon came to office, when he met his the first day he met his cabinet, he said to all the members, yeah, you're not all yes men, are you? And they all said, no. <laughs> a related incident, a girl once sent me a, a Q cartoon in which uh, a master was speaking to his frightened looking servant and said, I hate yes men, Jeeves, don't you? A same girl, by the way, sent me a delightful, knowing my love of paradox, sent me a Chinese fortune cookie with the following message inside. It said, do not depart from the path that fate has chosen for you. A related incident to the yes and no, the philosopher Sidney Morgan Besser was once in England at a conference on linguistics. And the lecturer said, it's a very curious thing. In many, many languages, a double negative makes a positive. There's no language in which a double positive makes a negative, but which Morgan has said, yeah, yeah. Speaking of philosophers, let me tell you three jokes I like. Mm. The first one is about Descartes. He was on an airplane, and the hostess came over to him and said, Monsieur Descartes, would you like a cocktail? He said, I think not, and disappeared. The second joke is 
about a philosopher who went into a closet for 25 years. He wanted to contemplate what life really was. When he came out, he met a colleague on the street who asked him, Jim, where have you been all these years? He said, in a closet. What were you doing in a closet? I was contemplating what life really is. And have you found an answer? Yes. What is it? Well, it could best be described by saying that life is like a bridge. You know, that's very interesting, but could you be a little bit more specific? Just how is life like a bridge? He thought, ah, uh, Oh, maybe you're right. Maybe it's not like a bridge. Then there's a story about the philosopher's dream. In his dream, first Aristotle came by. He said to Aristotle, can you give me a 15-minute thumbnail sketch of your entire philosophy? And to his amazement, Aristotle did an excellent expository job. He really packed in the essential ideas. But then the philosopher the dreamy philosopher had an objection to Aristotle's system, which Aristotle could not answer. And Aristotle was embarrassed and melted away. Then Plato came by, and they went through the same routine. And he had the same objection, the dreamy philosopher had the same objection to Plato's system as he had to Aristotle's system. And again, Plato couldn't answer it and melted away. And so all the philosophers of history, from the ancients down to the medievals, down to the moderns, one by one, they all came, and he had the same objection to every one of their systems, and none of them could answer it. Well, after the last philosopher had vanished, the dreaming philosopher said to himself, I know I'm asleep and dreaming all this, but here I've discovered a universal refutation for all philosophical systems. And when I wake up tomorrow, I will have forgotten it, and the world will miss something very important. If only I could wake myself up and write this down. Well, with an iron effort, he woke himself up, rushed to his writing desk, wrote, wrote down his universal refutation, and went back to bed with a sigh of relief. Next morning, he remembered what he had written, and he rushed to the writing desk. He remembered the dream, and he remembered the fact that he gave a universal reputation. So he rushed to the writing desk to see what the universal reputation was. And what he read was, that's what you say. You know, the following incident is true. It's about the philosopher and psychologist William James. James, once in his sleep, believed he had discovered the fundamental secret of the universe. And he did manage to wake himself up and write it down. The next morning, he read what he had written, which was, Hogamus, Higamus, man is polygamous. Higamus, Hogamus, woman is monogamous. I love the story by William James, who once asked a kid, do you know what faith is? He said, yeah. Faith means believing something you know ain't true. Do you know the difference between a philosopher and a theologian? A philosopher is one who looks in a dark room for a black cat who isn't there. A theologian is one who looks in a dark room for a black cat who isn't there and finds it. Speaking of faith and theology, incidentally, some of you might be interested in that the last book I wrote, which is on religion, its title is, Who Knows? A Study of Religious Consciousness published by Indiana University Press. The reason I say that some of you will be interested in this is that the first third of the book is devoted entirely to a critique of the religious writings of Martin Gardner in his book, The Wise of the Philosophical Scrivener. You know, something has been puzzling me very much. Why is it on television these days, people are discussing the conflict between evolution and intelligent design. That's a false dichotomy. There's no conflict whatsoever between evolution and intelligent design. Many people who believe in evolution believe that evolution itself was intelligently designed. The real conflict is between 
evolution and creationism, creationism which uh, holds that human beings did not evolve from lower life forms. That's a real conflict, but there's no conflict between evolution and intelligent design. Going back to Bertrand Russell, uh, I must tell you how I once received a compliment, quite unintentionally. The person thought it was not a compliment at all. It happened this way. In my high school days, I was a real fan of Bertrand Russell. Well, I was taking an English course in high school. The teacher was a lady, highly cultured, very, very well read, but extremely unconventional. Uh, rather extremely conventional, excuse me, extremely conventional. Now, <laughs> we had to write uh, essays. And uh, one of my essays, I wrote an essay which was uh, expressed some very radical ideas. She returned me the paper with a comment. Your th English is good, but your thinking is confused. Come and see me in my office. So next day, I went to her office and we discussed various things. We discussed various authors. And at one point I asked her, what do you think of Bertrand Russell? And she angrily replied, he's like you, he's confused. Boy, did I feel good. It's like, this is very funny that uh, once I was reading Bertrand Russell to my mother, and at one point she interrupted me and said, you know, he reminds me of you. Let me tell you now a very charming incident. In Princeton, there was a little girl, grade school girl, who was doing very badly in mathematics. And during a space of one month, her uh, mathematics improved considerably. And once her mother asked her, how come you're doing better now in mathematics? She said, oh, I heard there was a teacher here who teaches real good. So I went to his house. I go to his house every afternoon and he helps me with our arithmetic. He teaches real good. I forget his name. Something like I, uh, Stock or Stein, something like that. It was indeed Albert Einstein. The little girl came to him and uh, he helped her, of course. <coughs> I love the following incident about Albert Einstein. Einstein once said to a colleague that he didn't like teaching at a co-ed college. When the colleague asked why, he said because with all the beautiful girls in the run, the boys wouldn't pay attention to physics and mathematics. The colleague said, oh, come on now, Albert. You know some of the boys will listen to what you have to say. Einstein replied, oh, such boys are not worth teaching. You know, Einstein was a close friend of the largest in Kurt Gödel. And uh, I have in the house an elementary mathematics textbook, which actually uh, discusses a little bit Gödel and his theorem. And there's a photograph under which is the title Kurt Gödel. The photograph is actually of Einstein. It's amazing. I can understand the person who made the mistake didn't know what Gödel looked like, but I can't understand why he or she didn't know what Einstein looked like. 